Hi everyone, I hope you're all having an amazing day. If you've been a subscriber to my channel for quite some time, you might know that I've been mainly using for macro photography in the field, my APS-C Canon ATD, along with the Canon EF 100mm macro lens with or without the Reynolds PCI 250 snap-on lens or the Laowa 25mm ultra macro lens. A couple of weeks ago, I decided to switch to my full-frame camera, which is the 1DX Mark II. It's a more versatile setup and it's also capable of shooting in 4K and also allows me to shoot uh, using higher ISO ranges when there isn't much ambient light available. The rest of my setup remained the same, the usual reflector, diffuser kit from Crafty Bells and also the 600DX RT2 flash. Today I will show you several macro shots of different species that I captured at a local nature reserve. I will describe each, give a bit of background information. I hope you will enjoy, so let's get those images up. First, I'd like to show you a few images of mushrooms and fungi. I found some really interesting facts in a short article on whatsinyourbackyard.org. I will leave a link to it in the description. Did you know that fungi are more closely related to animals because they actually gather their food? They also represent 90% of total biomass in forest soils and about 25% of the entire biomass on our planet. Another fascinating fact is that with every breath we take, we might inhale about four fungal spores, so up to 90,000 every day. The fungal spores of some mushrooms can also sit dormant for decades and start to grow again when the environmental conditions become suitable, so they are extremely resistant. Anyway, I highly recommend you check out this brief article as it contains many more cool facts on fungi. In these first couple of shots, you can see some morning dew that's been accumulated on top of those fine filaments, which looks pretty cool. I think the substrate that the fungus started to grow on was some sort of decaying animal matter. The next three shots are of common bonnets that started to grow on the side of a dead tree trunk. The stripes on the caps created an interesting pattern, which I quite liked. The following image is of a very tiny mushroom not sure of the species, I noticed it on the bark of a eucalyptus tree. I had to crouch down because I wanted to capture it from a low angle as I always loved how amazing the gills look and the kind of geometric precision in the way they grow. I decided to include these last couple of pictures as well because I found some really tiny organisms on these mushrooms. If I zoom in, you can see several minuscule springtails. I'd say they weren't longer than a millimeter. Springtails are common insects that live in leaf litter and specialize in recycling dead plant material into nutrients. They eat bacteria, fungi, lichens, algae and decaying vegetation, fertilizing the soil in the process. Some feed on carrion and a few carnivorous species eat other springtails and small invertebrates. Some species eat plant roots, occasionally damaging potted or greenhouse plants. In most cases, however, they benefit plants. They are called springtails because they have a tail-like appendage on the fourth abdominal segment, which is folded beneath the body and held under tension by a structure called tenaculum. When released, it snaps against the substrate and flings the springtail in the air for rapid evasion. Based on found fossils, they have been in existence for over 400 million years. Also apparently a species called Cryptopygus antarcticus is capable of living in extremely cold environments such as Antarctica and able to reanimate after it had been frozen. The next few shots are of different lichen species I captured. They were growing on small branches and I found the very last one on tree bark. Lichens are composite organisms that arise from algae or cyanobacteria living among filaments of multiple fungi species in mutualistic relationships. They vary greatly in color and size and many look like plants, but they are not plants. They don't have roots, for example, that absorb water and nutrients as plants do. They produce their own nutrition by photosynthesis. Their primary source of most elements is the air and therefore elemental levels in lichens often reflect the accumulated composition of ambient air. That is the main reason why they can be used as effective biomonitors of atmospheric quality. Most lichens grow extremely slowly, less than a millimeter per year. They are considered to be amongst the oldest living organisms. An arctic species called map lichen has been dated at 8600 years, apparently the world's oldest living organism. Our very next species is a dark-winged fungus gnat. They are small, dark, short-lived gnats that feed on fungi growing on soil, which helps in the decomposition of organic matter. What I found really fascinating is that some fungus gnats are exceptionally hardy, being able to tolerate cold conditions through their possession of antifreeze proteins. During winter, these proteins protect their head and thorax from freezing, which is crucial in maintaining the integrity and health of their neural tissue. 
This next image, at first glimpse, might also look like some kind of mushroom, and that was my first impression as well. After I had uploaded the images to iNaturalist, it was identified as the exec of a two-tailed spider. I don't think I've ever captured one, but I will definitely be on the lookout for these, as they look quite amazing. These tree trunk spiders are also called two-tailed spiders, because they have unusually long posterior lateral spinnerets. The next several images are of three different orb weaver species I captured. They are the most common group of builders of spiral wheel-shaped webs, often found in gardens, fields and forests. If you want to learn more about this group of spiders, in particular about the golden orb weaver, which produces one of the strongest spider silks in the world, then you should definitely check out my mini-series, which has three videos of a beautiful female, including footage and many macro shots of her laying protective silk on her golden egg sac. The first two images are of a white-winged orb weaver. This is a small spider, where the female's body length can reach 4mm, and the males are about half their size. They construct loose, tangled webs, in shrubs, just like this next species, which is an angulate and round-shouldered orb weaver. This genus of common orb weaving spiders present the most obvious case of sexual dimorphism, where males typically are only one-third or one-quarter of the size of females. They are venomous, but only deliver dry bites 80% of the time, and males are much less aggressive. In this last stack shot, which was of a very small typical orb weaver, you can see a tiny specimen holding the remains of its pre-digested victim with its chelicery. I decided to include a cute-looking jumping spider as well. This is a small garden jumping spider that was doing a bit of reconnaissance on a small leaf. If you love jumping spiders, then I've got you covered. I'll leave a link to a playlist that you can explore and enjoy. This next species I captured shows the larval stage of a honey brown beetle. These gold brown colored beetles are pretty common in southeastern mainland Australia and Tasmania. They feed on dead plant and fungal matter. If you want to see how much effort it took me to capture a series of shots of adults just before taking off and in flight, then definitely check out this video too. This next image is of a beautiful metallic colored soldier fly. I had never seen this particular species before. The family of soldier flies is huge. It contains over 2,700 species. Adults are normally found near larval habitats such as damp places in soil, animal excrement or decaying organic matter. They are very diverse in shape and size, ranging from a few millimeters up to two centimeter and are somewhat wasp-like mimics. The second last species that I'm only going to talk about very briefly is a mono ant. The exoskeleton of this species is highly reflective and I really like those tiny bright hairs growing out of their abdomen that has a symmetric wing-like pattern on it. This species is considered a minor pest in some orchards. I also have some extreme macro footage of a mono ant drinking honey that you should check out where you could even see its reflection on the surface of the drop of honey. This very last series of shots I'm going to show you is of a red velvet mite. I have seen quite a few around at this time of the year on branches, back and even on the ground for example on moss. These mites can vary greatly in size, all the way from 0.4mm to approximately 3mm. They have a bright red color and velvety appearance. Red velvet mites are extremely important to the environment and are part of a community of soil arthropods that play a crucial role in maintaining the structure of the entire ecosystem by feeding on insects that eat fungi and bacteria which stimulates the decomposition process. They have lobster-like claws as mouth parts and are closely related to spiders and scorpions. They can live up to several years depending on the species. The larvae attach themselves to a variety of arthropods and feed on them parasitically, for example sucking blood from a gnat or grasshopper. Their preys include other mites and their eggs and can be used as a biological pest control agent. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this compilation that I put together. If you have any kind of feedback, please leave a comment down below. Also, if you're new to my channel and you are into macro photography, nature photography, I've got plenty of content for you to check out. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy. Thank you so much again for watching and see you all very soon in the next one.